So today is uh, the time for discussing a bit uh, the, the techniques uh, and for task analysis. Okay. Uh, we already mentioned a couple of words uh, uh, last time about uh, uh, what uh, is task analysis and how it fits uh, in, the, in the overall process. Well, actually, we can see it as a way of uh, formalizing what you discover about user behavior during the need finding phase, uh, and may also become a sort of a preliminary specification for the activities that the user can, can uh, perform uh, by interacting with your system. Okay? Um, in a way, knowing what the users will do and in what order will help us in defining which uh, user interface elements uh, we need and where to put them, okay? Uh, and so also for organizing the, the interface and the workflow of the user. In a way, we are trying to transition between how the user is doing a given task today with the tool that he or she has today, and we transition to how the, the same user will do the tool in the future with our proposed system, okay? Um, so, this is one possible uh, representation technique uh, for expressing this kind of uh, decompositions. So, see how a user knows uh, uh, their goal and how they split their goal into a sequence of, uh, uh, of actions and the knowledge that they need to have uh, in order to perform this set of actions. Hmm? Uh, last time we, we made the example of, of the vacuum cleaner or uh, using a projector that requires a set of steps uh, which are not uh, so difficult, but at least you should understand what you are doing, otherwise you risk of fiddling with the system for one hour and not obtaining uh, what you actually need. Hmm? So, um, the main, uh, probably, takeaway for, for today's class is this slide. So I try to be very uh, clear about uh, um, the levels at which we are describing uh, user actions. Mm -hmm. So the goal is, embeds the motivation of the user. Why do I want to do that operation, okay? So the goal is never, for example, login to the website. So it's not a goal in itself, okay? It doesn't bring any satisfaction and any, any value. The goal could be maybe obtaining some information and one of the steps would be uh, uh, of logging in and then going to the section where you have the information that you need, okay? So to reach this goal, you need uh, to organize a set of tasks. So first logging and then go and find information and read the messages. And each of these tasks, so every task has a start and the beginning, and together they compose a longer sequence of interactions that may allow the user to reach their goal. And every task on itself is uh, um, made up of a sequence of uh, actions. Now, for example, for logging, you have to enter your login, you enter your name, you confirm and maybe uh, confirm on the mobile device or whatever, the second factor. And so there are set, a set of um, actions that let you complete that task. Once you completed that task, you move to, on to the next task that, uh, um, that will allow you to get closer and closer to the goal. Hmm? Simple tasks are just, uh, uh, say, actions without uh, meaning. Okay, if I enter my email into a, 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 so a text box, uh, it doesn't mean anything by itself. This text box may be anything. Maybe a login text box, maybe a subscription for, uh, I don't know, a, a newsletter or whatever. Okay, so actions by themselves don't have any meaning, but they are single steps, okay, in, in, a, larger, in a larger task. A task may have a meaning uh, to the system, in the system language, then, you know, the login functionality is something which is clear. It's a functional requirement, but, but by itself, it doesn't need to have a meaning for the user, okay? The meaning for the user is at a, at a higher level, 
of goals. So what we get from the need finding are the user goals. Some idea of the user tasks, uh, of the current user tasks, and we need to plan the future user tasks that we are proposing uh, for reaching the same goals in a different way, or in a better way, or for reaching new goals that currently cannot be, uh, are not supported or cannot be reached. And then designing the actions, of course, in, uh, implies the detailed design of the interface itself. So the screens, the buttons, uh, the elements where the user is uh, acting on them. Actually, hmm? So what we want to try here is to articulate uh, the description at the task level. Um, there may be many, we know from observation that many different people may approach the same goal or the same objective in different ways. But of course, we should then uh, try to represent some of these uh, ways, some of these procedures, in order to be, to support them with our, with our system, okay? Uh, so to be first understand why users are executing tasks in a way, in some way, and then we can formalize them. We understand how the user perform their tasks and what is the, the goal that they have in mind when they perform those. Uh, the task is more explicit. You see them performing it and people can talk about it, okay? The goal is something that we, we should understand, we should let's say, uh, learn from the observation because the user, strange enough, don't think about, don't talk or don't express themselves in terms of goals. They see their task, they see, they know that, okay, uh, I have to enter my data in this form. This is a, a task by itself doesn't mean anything. The user, of course, enters some data in the, into that form because he wants uh, to enroll, he wants to reply to a questionnaire or whatever, okay? But the final goal is difficult, is very seldom expressed by the users. Hmm? So, but we, we know, we, we, are, we will recognize these two levels. Hmm? But at the test level, uh, why are, are we say, trying to represent tasks? Well, first of all, tasks are closely related with the functionalities of the website or the application, okay? Uh, if the user, sh for reaching some goal, needs to do a task of, I don't know, uh, rating and ranking uh, uh, other people's contents or whatever, or approving some letter or some proposal in a workflow, okay, if this task is required by the user, then it needs to be supported by the system. Hmm? And so it's, uh, it translates quite directly into functional specifications for the system. What are the functions the system must support. And then this function can be combined in different ways according to the user path and the user goals. And combining tasks means planning the navigation of the website or the system. So I have to task one and then task two. And inside the task, I have different actions that are, should be done maybe sequentially. So I need to provide some internal navigation and some broader navigation from move for moving from task one or to task two. After I log in, where do I go? If I need to, uh, you know, uh, upload my homework, in which section should I go to start the tasks that will lead to this result? And so on. And so, in a way, we are transitioning from understanding the user to designing the system. Uh, this is an example, very simple. You can take any window. This is a dialog for printing, for example. And uh, there you can see from this window all the possible actions that the user can do. So every button, every uh, checkbox is a button, is, sorry, is an action. The user can click on it, the user can select it, the user can write on it, and so on. But uh, you don't see these uh, buttons by themselves. They're in some way grouped. They're grouped by, you know, similarity of the actions. And this 
groups more or less correspond to the different tasks that the user may or may not need to do. Hmm? So once is uh, selecting the printer. So this set of items, is, uh, we have a drop down, we have a properties button, we have a print to file option and so on. We are selecting the destination. In the second group, we are filtering the source. What are we printing? Which subset and in which format? Uh, then we are, we are planning you know, the, the output. How many copies do you want them in an order or another? And so on. Okay, here we have the customization of the content. And uh, uh, on the bottom, we have you know, some, some properties. You know? So you see that uh, different parts respond to different questions. So if the goal of the user is just printed, it will open the window and click OK. If the goal of the user is to try to print, uh, a hand, uh, for example, the handouts uh, of a lecture with uh, small slides, uh, three per page, uh, um, on both sides of the, of the paper, so in the, in the user's mind, we have two additional tasks. Select, uh, I want to print handouts, and I want to print them double-faced, okay? And so we activate in some way. We use some portion of this interface, and probably the, what we are thinking when we select what we print, we don't need, I would say, I, if I'm selecting what I want to print, I only deal with this portion of the, of the interface. And in that moment, I'm not thinking about the printer, not thinking about the uh, uh, print range or so on. Because there are different moments. I may need them or not. Okay, so behind this example window, there is this, this, the assumption that the user may want or not to do some task. In this case, all of these tasks are optional. And in fact, we have a sensible default and we can just go to the end and, and click on the OK button. But otherwise, every portion allows the user to, depending on their goal, to execute the task or not. So this is a, is a, is a, is a micro example, huh? a microscopic example. So everything in one window. But the same we can see for example, in a, in a website that has different pages or in a an online procedure that has several steps, okay? We are always assisting the user to reach their final goal through a sequence of steps. In this case, all these steps are optional and they may be done in, in any order. And so, there are not so many, they are not so complex, so everything may just fit into one window. If we had some requirement for ordering the steps, I probably would have designed two different windows, step one and step two, so that the user cannot mix the order or doesn't have the option of executing the task in the wrong order. There is no right or wrong order here, so having everything together is fine. So you see that even simple design decisions are the consequence of which tasks we want to provide the user and in which constraint the user may need to, uh, to execute them. Hmm? So even if in, in this course we are not requiring you to do a formal task analysis, so if you want to do that as a, as a result of the finding just to represent what we what found, it's a tool that you may use, but we, all, we won't have it ask you for deliverable about uh, task analysis, it's really the inflection point from uh, the finding above and the requirements uh, uh, below of the functional specification, so the requirement of the system, there is some information for building the interface, and also some information for the documentation. We never think about documentation, but it's also an important part, uh, and uh, describing how the user accomplishes uh, uh, the results uh, is important, okay? So in many cases, documentation tends to be bottom up. You have this window, and this window have, has uh, 
27 different option, options, and I will explain you one by one what these options are doing. Okay? And this is maybe the view that a programmer would have in this case. This is the window. Each of these buttons cost me five, ten li lines of code. I will tell you what that tab box does, one by one. It will be there very difficult for the user, or it's a, it's a form of documentation. But it doesn't help the user understand how it works. No? It doesn't help the user understand the mental model that is behind this set of controls. It would deal with them, say, one by one in a bottom-up fashion. But if we link the, the existence of those buttons to a task, these buttons are there because they contain the, the options that you need or the information, they collect the information that you need if you want to perform this task. So a task-driven documentation is much more useful because if the user wants to do something, there he finds the, the details or, on how to do them. You don't need to explain the user how to check a box. Huh? But why is there? It's, a, it's a, an interesting part. There are many techniques for doing this, for trying to represent and structure this uh, task analysis, uh, we will have a look uh, at the first two items in this list, uh, which are the more, let's say, practical one, the simplest one. Um, but, uh, of course, uh, if, if, if you need to do that, there's a lot of, uh, say, other methods, other information that you could uh, exploit. Hmm? So let's start with the simplest one, the hierarchical task analysis, uh, HTA, hierarchical task analysis is one possible method for representing tasks through the application of a decomposition pattern. So we try to take a task and say, okay, this, this task should be decomposed or can be decomposed into a number of subtasks. And each of those can be further decomposed into sub subtasks and, and so on. So that's the hierarchical nature of this method which is quite natural for us, I would say. We are reasoning top down and we try to break a complex problem down into smaller ones and so on until you find a very elementary action. So you have a tree where the task is the, the root, the source node, and the actions are the leaves of this tree. And uh, in addition to saying which are the intermediate nodes, so what are the subtasks, we should also explain the um, ordering constraints of this task. Are all of them optional? Are all of them mandatory? Are there any temporal dependencies? So subtask 3.2 can only be done after 1.7 or the order is arbitrary or whatever. So in addition to the decomposition, which is a static view, we should also need to provide some dynamic information you know, for uh, providing the rules you know, for defining the, the legal sequences of, of subtasks. So for example, the cleaning task that we used before and as an example is a, an example, a classical example of a mainly sequential task, where the subtask should be executed uh, in, in order. Hmm? You cannot uh, clean the rooms uh, if, we don't, if you don't get the vacuum cleaner before. So task num uh, step number three should be done after step number one, and so on. Hmm? And so um, we have a sequence of you have this, uh, the starting task here, cleaning the house, and you decompose it into one, two, three, four, five tasks, or subtasks, it depends on uh, if you want to, to stress on the sub part, uh, on the hierarchy, the hierarchy, say, prefix, which is sub, and some of them may be further decomposed into smaller tasks and so on, hmm? until the final task is simple enough that you can call it an action, just do it. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a set of plans and you must de de um, 
specify the order in which the subtasks are performed. Um, for example, and we are not writing an algorithm yet. We are not writing pseudocode or a flowchart. Uh, it's simpler here. We don't need to, to, to program, actually. No? It will become later. It's just a way of representing information. So one way in HTA, the way of representing the possible constraints of execution of the subtask is to provide a set of plans. Okay, a plan is a possible ordering of the tasks. So task zero can be executed according to plan zero. And the plan, plan zero means the plan for executing task zero. The plan for executing task zero is doing one, two, three, and five in that order. And uh, sometimes you can also do four when needed. So four is not really between three and five. It may happen any time if you need to, to empty the, the dust bag, or maybe you can skip it if you don't need it. Okay, so they are in order, in the order when we think and of the decomposition of activities, but they may not be executed entirely in order. For example, we have a task number three, which is a complex task, so we can describe the plan for executing this task. And in this case, it's just a, a, a simple composition of subtasks in any order, depending on which room is cleaning. So uh, they are all optional and unordered. So when thinking about a possible user interface for a robot that is going to clean our house, uh, we should have the opportunity of selecting which rooms we want to clean or, or having the information about uh, which room needs cleaning. So it's another, that would be another task. Um, and uh, choosing the order or just letting the system run into some default ordering. So we are starting to think about which elements we, we need to put uh, okay, into our system to support this kind of task. Um, okay, this is what uh, we say before. And of course, every plan <laughs> or every task can be described at different uh, uh, levels of detail. So for example, one different, uh, uh, say, specification for plan for executing point three, so plan three would be okay, uh, the hall should be cleaned every day, the living rooms at least once a week, uh, and the bedrooms uh, only when visitors are due. It's, it's not something I would like in my house, but uh, okay, just as an example, okay? So you may have maybe a, a other requirements that can dictate the schedule for executing this subtask. In the first uh, definition, we, we just say when they need cleaning. In the second case, okay, okay, we have a, re a plan which is more specific because we have some rules. Hmm? It depends whether at this stage we really need uh, to go into that detail or we have the information for going to that detail. Hmm? There is no, like in programming, uh, at the end you have to write code, so that is the, the end point. Uh, the final decomposition task is writing code instruction. Here, you, you just stop when you have specified enough information for you to be confident to go forward with the project. So the decomposition actually uh, answers to the question, what subtask might be accomplished to, to perform the main task, okay? And the answer, is uh, informed by our observation task, okay? We know how a task should be decomposed, how a task should be performed, because we observe the users during those tasks. Okay, maybe we already have some pre previous knowledge by ourselves, but mainly we should try to represent the user's knowledge there. Um, And uh, after we have decomposed the task, so we have a, a static picture 
okay, of the breakdown of the activities, uh, we should try to <coughs> understand the relationships between them. Okay, so is there a fixed sequence or not? So this is something that we can observe or we can try to reproduce and see whether, or in our mind, whether the order is important. Are there any preconditions or triggers that tell me that the execution of some task at one stage will trigger another task that will be executed later on? Are they connected in some way? Are there, uh, are there, are there any interdependencies between these subtasks? Are there any exceptions? If a task uh, can be completed for some reason, what should they do? Is the, will the, the whole task be, uh, be aborted? So if I don't remember the password, of course I should ab abort the, the login task. Maybe I can move to the recover password task, which is a different one. I change my goal. My goal will not be end to enter, but try to, to recover a situation. Or maybe some other uh, uh, errors can be recovered, can just be ignored, and not so important, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so these are just sample questions that we may ask our, ourselves uh, to describe how these uh, subtasks uh, compose into plans. Okay, so the dynamic uh, sequence, uh, the allowed legal sequences of the task. And you, <clears throat> with the, this hierarchical process, you can repeat the same procedure. Get, take a task, try to decompose it, and try to discover the ordering and relationship and the dependencies among the subtasks. And you repeat it again and again, until, so you expand the tasks. Uh, the suggestion here is expanding only the relevant tasks. Okay? You expand the task, uh, not because it's easy, but because it's not clear to you. So uh, it's not so important, just to follow the example, to expand a lot, in a lot of detail, the login task. Okay, login is a login. Let's not waste time on that. Let's use our time in trying to expand the tasks which are unclear or where we put more value no, for our project. Uh, where a task is uh, obvious to the user, we know that this user so it's a no-brainer for them, we will just execute it, let's not expand it, okay? Maybe we can just try uh, to ensure that they are not uh, read, or if they fail, uh, what happens? Uh, but we shouldn't waste time in, uh, in expanding those. So we stop the expansion of tasks, so we start for one task, decompose, 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 until, until we find a task, that we think is not so relevant or it will be easy to the user, so they take it for granted, or when we go down to the level of motor action. So when you're trying to say, click, enter, write, at that point they are, uh, say, motor action, there are ac physical actions by the user, and so we don't need to decompose them any further. So we are not in the design phase, we'll be in the, in the execution phase, okay? So uh, in the worst case, you go down to this level. But in, many, in most of the cases, you, you don't need to go down to all these levels, okay? And uh, again, it's not, uh, our aim is not to be complete and to describe everything in the, in the fullest of details, but to have a, a, an easy representation for putting together our thoughts, our opinions about a lot of observations we do. So this is another representation, another possible representation, a graphical one, uh, corresponding to the, to the numbered list that we saw before, okay? It's their equivalent. Huh? This one, we, let's say, will show the hierarchy. There may be some uh, convention here where we have the, 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 any task or subtask in a box with their number. We have the explicitation of the hierarchy with these uh, lines, where actually task one is decomposed into one, 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 two, one, three, and four. And in the decomposition arrow here, we have the plan. The description of what are the constraints 
for decomposing this task zero into this set of six uh, subtasks. So in this case, uh, we need to do, we are making a cup of tea, so do one first, boil the water, and uh, if the pot is full, then do three and four. Three and four, you put in the tea leaves and pour in boiling water. Uh, so three and four can be done at the same time, there's no constraint, but of course uh, three and four should be done after one, and so on. And then pour tea, wait for, for minutes, and so on. So this is a description, what we call the plan, that tells me how to select and choose in, in which order the subtasks. And we see that uh, task number one has been further decomposed do we need, do we really need uh, to decompose the task, uh, say, in boiling water? Probably not, we could stop there. But if we need it, then there's an example of, of how to do that. And so, and so we have the decomposition, graphical, let's say, representation, and the description, the textual description of the plan. They will tell me te do one, 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 two, and one, three in that order immediately, and later on, 1.4. Under a condition. So we have a trigger condition here. In this case, it's, a, it's an external event that will tell us when we can execute 1.4. Okay. Uh, in this graphical representation, we also have uh, this line here below. They will say, I'm not going to decompose it any further. Okay. I stop here. So that we, uh, I, I haven't forgotten to decompose it. I decided, I chose not to do it. And I write it a line. It's, as a representation, it's equivalent to this one, okay, that we had before. It depends on whether you feel more comfortable with sketching something on paper or writing uh, lists and so on. Um, and uh, that uh, try to also be say, consistent with the level of detail in which you are describing the task. So imagine I'm asking a question, what are you doing right now? So what is your, the task that you are currently executing? And so all these answers are valid and may be valid all, all at the same time. I'm typing control B, the action level, the motor level. And control B makes a word bold. So I'm doing this action for making a word bold. And why do I need to, why do I want to make it bold? For adding emphasis to that word. And emphasizing a word is one task, one possible task in the edition of the document, in the editing of the document. So one could also reply, okay, I'm writing a document. I'm modifying document. Or this is just a, a neutral description. I'm editing a document. This is a, is a view that a, a word processor may have. Writing a letter is something that is more the user mind. This is not any document, it's a letter. And this letter is for a legal case or for my resume or for my uh, report or whatever. So the last one is the goal. Hmm? Uh, my goal is to prepare a legal case. How do you do that? Okay, I write a letter. This is the, the, the top level task. And the others may be subtasks. And if you are planning uh, you know, a system for helping uh, people writing legal documents, you may imagine that. Uh, do you, in your task analysis, do you really need to specify that uh, making words bold is done by clicking Control B? Maybe not, maybe it's something that you can take for granted and you can stop probably here, editing a document, and uh, the editor should have the capability of uh, formatting text using the usual formatting commands like bold, italics, or whatever. Hmm? 
So we don't need to, to go to the, to the motor level every, every time. So in a way, if we are reading the task decomposition in the reverse order, like we did in the slides, you see that from line to line, we are always asking the same question, why? I think because why? Because I want to make the work bold. Why? Because they want to, uh, the, this, this word to stand out. Why? Okay, I'm writing this doc and so on. Okay? So the decomposition is the inverse of how, uh, why. The decomposition asks the question how? How do you edit a letter? How do you make a word uh, uh, stand out? How do you emphasize a word? And the reverse is. Um, and try to answer to the question, how? And the why and the how are the, the tool for understanding the what. Okay, the what is the actual action, the actual task. But in order to decompose or to design it, we need to understand the why or how that we saw that there are actually two phases of, of the same method. Um, okay, once we have a, um, a task analysis, for example, as a hierarchy, we can start playing with that. So it can also be a design tool. Let's start moving stuff around. Let's start see whether we can simplify some steps. Are some steps really necessary? Do I really need your confirmation when I send a document or not? Is it optional? Is it mandatory? Can we do these two tasks in parallel? Are there independence and so on? So first, it's a, we start with the description of the real task, of the current task. And then we can try to manage it, to improve it. Uh, we can check whether all these uh, descriptions are at the same level. Uh, if we have a typing control B here and uh, uh, editing a presentation there, they don't match. So to, to match, they should be more or less at the same level, the same abstraction level. So if there are some mismatches, maybe we were too simple on some aspect or we were too detailed on some other aspect, and so we'll try to merge some tasks, sub tasks or decompose some others in order to have something which is balanced and, and consistent. And we can may ask, uh, what if there are problems? What if we want to generalize or repeat it uh, for more time? So if we want to make three cups, should they boil three separate kettles for that? Or maybe just one part that will, re will be repeated and some other part that just is the same, keep, uh, stay, stays the same. Hmm? So once you have this representation, it's easy to ask these questions because you have some picture in front of you. It's not all abstract reasoning. And this will help us to refine the specification, the requirements for, for what we are going to build uh, next week, basically. Um, let's not forget about the users, okay? These kind of representations can also be shared with users. So if we, if we, if we write a sentence, maybe we can spend uh, one minute or two minutes in showing this, this composition to the users to say, okay, do you understand the meaning of this sentence? If it would be a, a functionality of the system, would you understand what it does? Because otherwise we are still in time to try to rephrase or to represent it in a way that more closely matches this understanding. Okay, let's never forget every step, like, no, when you are, maybe I already made this example, when you are writing code, you stop and debug every so often. And the same here, but we are not programming, we are designing, so we must stop and debug with the user every so often. Hmm? Okay, this is an example of how the same ATI can be reorganized, but uh, I, I think uh, we got the details. Uh, Okay, we have some loops uh, for generalizing, we have some options, uh, ifs, uh, and so on. We don't need to be so, so complex. So we basically 
ACA, a record character analysis, uh, is a sort of a pseudo programming representation based on hierarchy plus a sort of primitives uh, for uh, main, say, control tasks uh, or timing uh, uh, constraints uh, between the different tasks. Hmm? Um, it's not a formal language by itself, but usually you can use this kind of constru construct that we are all familiar with. Uh, the fact that we are familiar with uh, cycles, with uh, say with loops, uh, with uh, conditionals, uh, and uh, repetition, and triggers, and so on, um, for us it's normal because it's part of our background of programmers. But for the users, it isn't. So uh, the fact that we can express these complex relationships using simple concepts like this allows us also to share what we are thinking with the user. We don't need a user that understands uh, the index of a loop, uh, how it was uh, um, to understand our uh, pseudocode. Uh, we can share it at, the, at a level which is understandable even by people who don't have a, say, a computer background. Okay, so this is one technique. You want to use it or not? You feel it's useful, it depends, okay? But I think that at least at the top level when we are especially designing the new functionality of the system, it's better to stop a bit uh, and, uh, and start to see the big picture. Because when you are starting, so let me, sorry, go back here. When you start to implement, uh, forget about uh, uh, T caps, you know? Imagine these are functions on a, on a website. When you start, uh, e implementing or designing the details, each of these boxes will be a problem, will have technical problems, technical issues. And we will spend days and weeks uh, in trying to fight uh, uh, over these technical issues. Or over the interface, uh, you know, if, uh, or making it more usable and so on. If we don't have the big picture somewhere, we really risk of getting lost in the details and there's something that that it really doesn't flow because we lost track of what the user would feel because you are implementing one, one form and they, one form on a web page will take you three days. The user will click through that form into one second. So your perception of the development is very different from the perception of the user. Okay, so always try to have something that will help us be grounded Feet on our uh, on the ground. Uh, say this is what the user will see. These are the things that are important to the user. We need the user. We are in step. We are implementing step three. We need the user to move on to step four as soon as possible. In the easiest possible way. Hmm? So my suggestion is just at, at least at a high level try to do some kind of analysis like that for the main uh, task that you are designing. Yes. Do five, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. What you are saying is that if you if you say that uh, five comes after four, you don't need to write after four or five minutes. Okay. This is redundant. Redundant. Okay. There's redundant information here. So these are more, say, human readable notes uh, than programming instructions. So it's, uh, it's okay if, uh, in a previous version, I think that you already have this, uh, this problem. So step five wasn't even mentioned here. At least it was written in words here and in, as a separate task there. So it's not perfect. Mm, maybe the second one is more uh, precise. We could have. Uh, uh, so I don't find. I probably find something wrong with this being a task, because it doesn't involve uh, the user in any way. The user doesn't have to do anything. 
is just a condition for doing phi. There are no uh, uh, strict rules here, okay? So this is a, for example, this picture was taken from a book uh, where they were introducing this, this uh, methodology, okay? So they were their, their best example that they had, okay? Um, of course, for us it will be easier because we, are, we will be describing actual actions of the user, actual function of, of the system. So some, when you go to the physical world, it becomes more difficult. But yes, I agree that we could leave out this sentence here or we could leave out this box there if you want. Hmm? The worst thing we could do is to write uh, seven minutes here and three minutes there. So that would be uh, inconsistent. But if, if it is consistent and a bit redundant, it's not a big deal. Thanks for the debug. Okay, so that is a procedure, okay? More uh, on an, an, an operational information. Uh, I will just tell you something about a totally different approach, just to show that there are many ways of approaching the same problem from the cognitive point of view, or knowledge-based point of view. So uh, first, uh, we, 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 saw, we, we discussed how to do operation, how to decompose actions. Now we ask ourselves, what is the information hidden in these actions? The information provided by the system or the information that the user needs to have to operate the system. Okay, this will be more interesting, for example, the documentation. So you, you may have a manual, a set of instructions where you don't understand anything because it uses some words or some concept that you don't, have, don't, don't have, don't know. So it's not just uh, how to operate, uh, but uh, what is the purpose, what are the concepts that are involved. Okay. Um, and so in this case, uh, we, are, we are trying to represent the knowledge assumed by the user and embedded in the system that these two kinds of knowledge need to, to integrate huh, with each other. And for example, one possibility is trying to decompose according to some concept taxonomy. So uh, the example here is on the functionality of a car, okay? You are designing a new car and you want to list the functionality of the user interface of the car. So not about uh, uh, how the engine works, but about uh, what part of the car the user uses, feels, uh, and controls. Okay, so one part of the car would be the, all the motor controls that are composed of steering or checking the speed and the lights and the washing and so on. So, so the, different parts, uh, different functions of the car, different uh, functional areas. So controlling a car means controlling its direction, means controlling its speed, means controlling the lights, means controlling the wipers, the heat, the inside heating, uh, uh, the stopping, stopping or parking, uh, the radio entertainment, and so on. So these are not uh, tasks to be executed. These are different uh, knowledge areas that you, be, you need to be proficient or you need to be knowledgeable to be able to operate the car. You need to know how to steer. You need to know how to control the lights. Okay? It doesn't tell you how. It tells you that there is a subdomain of knowledge that you must possess. And on the right column, we have the user interface elements or the control elements. Some are commands you can give, some are information you can get that will allow you to interact with the engine on those specific topics, on those specific uh, set of knowledge. Okay, so talking about lights, uh, you may think about external lighting. So you have your 
uh, headlights. Uh, you, have, you can have your rear lights, back, the back lights. The hazard lights are the five uh, uh, blinking uh, lights that you can activate, or the internal lighting, so for lighting the inside of the car. There are two different concepts in the same domain of lighting, and they have different control. So this is a case, uh, quite easy, where we have a nearly one-to-one -one mapping uh, between one concept and one control. Uh, in, say, older or old-style interfaces, usually you have one button, one control, one lever for each different uh, concept, different area that you need to control. More complex systems, of course, cannot uh, have so many controls, and so you can find that the same controls uh, are, are mixed and matched together in a more complex way. Because you need uh, maybe with the same control to, do, to execute uh, different actions. So maybe in the steering wheel you have some menu buttons, uh, and you never know which action going up or down will do because it depends on the context, whether you have the radio on or off or whatever. So it becomes more complex because there will not be a physical mapping between a, a button, a physical action, and uh, the logical or the, the part of the, of the car that is being controlled. Hmm? Okay, so this is a sort of, a, again, apart from the, let's say, the usefulness of this representation for the purpose of documentation, it's also useful for a designer to break down the different areas, possibly in categories that correspond to the way the users are seeing the categories. Um, probably a car designer will put the foot brake and the hand brake in the same category. But the driver uses the foot brake while driving and the hand brake while parking. So for them, they are separate, they are different functions. They all act on the wheels, on the brake of the wheel, yes. So mechanically, they may be very similar. But we are not looking for the similarity, the implementation similarity. We are looking for the mindset for the moment, for the understanding, for the user understanding what he's doing or, or what he wants to do, and so listing the controls that the user needs to operate for getting to that result. Um, how to discover this kind of decomposition? Again, the difficult part is not listing some concepts or, or uh, arranging them. Arranging them, the difficult part is arranging them in the way the user is looking at them, is thinking at them. And of course, the user cannot be. Uh, we cannot expect the user to provide this representation for us. So we need to uh, ask them. Um, imagine that this is an enormous task. Whenever you have to design you know, any website, you have to come up with the categories, okay? the main menu. The choice of the names and the categories of the main menu tries to represent, or should represent, the way in which the user is thinking is grouping the different functionalities that you are providing. Okay? If you have a website where you cannot find information like the one for our university, it's because the names of the menus or, or of the section don't match what, what our mental model. It's like putting the brakes into one category instead of the driving one. Because uh, there's, a, there's a tendency of organizing the information according to the backend processes about the, how the bureaucracy is done, how the offices are, are organized. And this doesn't match how the user thinks about these procedures. Okay? Um, I'll give you an example. When you open a ticket, I cannot see you the screenshot because I don't, we don't see that part. You have a list of options of where this ticket should go, 
and basically it's a list of the offices of the student's office. And how are you supposed to know where does your problem fits? You choose one at random usually, okay? In, except some special cases. Uh, because uh, the problem that you have is something related to your career. And so if, uh, if some, let's say, enrolling in the first year or uh, renewing the script, the, the, um, what's the English word? Uh, okay, renewing for the second year. If these two tasks are handled by different offices, you don't know it. I don't know it. We are not supposed to know. Okay? Uh, and so the, the real question is, uh, what is the knowledge that the user have in their mind about the different processes that we are managing? And so if there is one process uh, that is split across different offices, for example, or one office that is with different processes, this should not be visible to the user. Okay? And instead, in many cases, in many websites, you find this, this organization, which is more on the organization of the provider rather than of the user. So it's not impossible, it's difficult, but it's not impossible to try to understand how people are organizing concepts and map the organization of the website according to the concepts in the mind of the users. There are tools or techniques for doing that. One very simple one is the card sorting, it's called. So you take a lot of post-its, the yellow post-its, and you write all the concepts on the post-its, and you take a group of users for fries and say, okay, let's try, organize this uh, post it on this wall by grouping the ones that are similar to you and try to give a title to each of, of these groups. Okay, you do it four times, you, you get four different results, of course, because people think in a different way, but at least you have the idea of the broad categories and for, from them you can start uh, organizing the content. So you have the individual actions, you need to have individual functions, but uh, uh, you don't want to group them according to how you execute them. You want to group them according to how the users want to look at them, hmm? want, want to find them. Hmm? There is a, a whole discipline called uh, information architecture for doing this kind of job. Organizing stuff, giving names to categories, names to items, names to menus, and so on. It's uh, one of the more difficult parts uh, of, the, of the design. And it's not always uh, unambiguous. Or uh, let's say there may be different ways of, of organizing the same information. Okay? So, for example, we have we had, we had two examples of very simple functionality. We have the wipers for the for our uh, glasses, car glasses, so the moving parts, and the washers. So they're spraying some water. They are separate functions. From the mechanical point of view, they're completely different. But usually they're operated together. They may be operated together, it depends. If you're washing your, your uh, windshield, you're usually pulling a lever that will operate the washer and the wiper at the same time, okay? So uh, you can organize so would you be more comfortable with the first organization or with the second one? In the first one, we have the wipers category, and you may have the front or the rear. Or, so by, by function. One function is wiping, and the other is washing. And washing, then we have the difference of the location. Or we may have a further composition of uh, location. So front stuff. And in the front, so in the windshield, they may have wipers and may have washers for the windshield. And the same for the back uh, window. So, there is no right or wrong here, okay? Don't, don't, don't think that they're, the, the green and red mean uh, right and wrong. They mean different, different points of view. Okay, when I'm cleaning my windshield, uh, I think about location. If 
because they want the washer and the wiper to be operated at the same time on the front windscreen. But maybe when it's uh, raining, I only care about wipers, and I, I want both front, front and rear wipers to be operated. So it depends on the context. There are different ways we can see the same, say, physical action according to what we want to accomplish, according to our goal. We are still trying to understand how to reach the goal for the user. So there are some cases, so first, there is no right answer. There are many options. Second, something tells us that we should leave some flexibility in the system. So maybe the same information or the same action or the same functionality can be reached in different ways across different paths because users may need that action in different moments, uh, in different contexts. So, both are correct, uh, can be useful. Like, we, we can decide to support both, uh, say, modes of navigation. Or we may choose one for consistency. So maybe all the application uh, reason about the functional way, and so uh, even if sometimes it, would, it could be, say, useful to have a positional decomposition, we use the functional one because all the rest of the website uh, uses the same functional decomposition. So the user learns how the website is organized and expect uh, some kind of uh, uh, decomposition to be applied. Hmm? Uh, as, as always, it's more important to be able to recognize the situation so that we can, say, design a solution. And the solution itself is less important because each, every solution is good if you recognize the problem. There may be different design choices, of course. The important is that we are aware that we are making choices. We're not just trying to stuff uh, things together. Hmm? You know, the, 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 the comparison that we may make uh, is the, with this website that we know all too well, where they try to do, do some decomposition on these boxes. But it's very difficult uh, to understand uh, the rule for the decomposition. Okay? What I say is that in some cases we have some offices, career service in the name of an office, that deals with different stuff, with stages, for example, but not only, also with post degree stuff and so on. Um, there are some boxes here that uh, are relevant to one procedure. By the way, the name of the procedure is not clear to anybody who haven't traveled it yet, okay? Uh, all these yellow boxes are, you know, why is the news board separate from the services? And why this, uh, TLA is separated from the career service. There are two different offices. One is for the stages and the other for the English certifications. But they are, so we, we, we struggle with this kind of interfaces because we cannot learn the criteria for the decomposition. There are a lot of items, a lot of action, a lot of functionalities but we don't learn the rule because there is no rule or the rule is whatever came out probably the organization of the offices or or just randomly okay um, we don't click in any of these we will do it later to discover more interesting stuff uh, these pages are really uh, useful for this course. Okay, um, so if we want to be more formal, more precise, or whatever, we can also, or, uh, people, you know, let's say, working with this um, uh, knowledge-based decomposition can also 
invent some formalists, uh, say, okay, uh, washing wiping is the uh, union, or, okay, the, the, the end function, so the, uh, the, um, the combination, okay, the Cartesian product, basically, of, uh, of two possible uh, decomposition. One is by function and the other by position. And by function may be one functionality which is wipe, which is uh, mutually exclusive with the washing functionality and so on. So the, we, we may try to have some formalism to describe this. I, I don't push for this, so I, I, I don't think it's for us so important to be able to do this kind of uh, precise representation, okay? Uh, I think it's more important for us to have at least the, the list of the concepts of the terms of the functions and try to organize them, to move them, according to some criteria. Functional criteria, okay, let's group. Try to imagine, for example, this page or the previous page of all the action that you find in these two or three pages. Okay, no, this, uh, sorry, I, I said the wrong one. Uh, where we have, again, other options and sub-options uh, how would you organize them in a way that follows some rule? It's not easy. Hmm? Uh, but at, at least trying to see all these concepts and try to make some, at least uh, first level grouping is important for us, hmm? especially for the navigation, for, for two purposes. Navigation of the system, so that main menus, and uh, consistency of the terminology. So we choose a name for that, uh, and we will always use that name because it's in the list of our concepts. Remember this uh, knowledge base, uh, the composition also represents the knowledge that the user needs to have in order to operate the system. If a user doesn't know about uh, handbrakes, it's a problem. You don't get your driver license if you, if you don't know what the handbrake is uh, and how to use it, okay? So it's a prior knowledge that is required and you can assume that the users have that knowledge. Okay? Try to use the right word, but because if you call it in, a, in another way, probably user won't recognize it. Okay, for example, I know the, the Italian word, everybody is talking about uh, freno a mano, the handbrake. But if you look at the, at the instruction, in many cases, they, they use the, the precise term, freno di stazionamento, no? is the, the correct word. But people probably are not familiar with, they, they don't use it normally. So always remember the rule, speak the language of the user. And uh, again, you can, discover taxonomies or hierarchies of concepts in the user interface. Or better, the other way around, you can plan your user interface according to the taxonomy. So in this case, we exploit the knowledge that a typeface, a font, typeface is a term which is not familiar with the user. But the user knows what the font is, what the style is, what the size is, what the color is. Maybe they, they don't know the, 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 the word that puts everything together. They will talk about maybe character formatting. In fact, in many editors, this control is under the format character. There is no menu select typeface because the word typeface is not uh, in the user knowledge, so it's better not to use it. Character formatting is better understood, and all, a lot of applications are using this term to mean something that technically has a different name. Hmm? And uh, the, the knowledge decomposition, that uh, typeface implies selecting a font, selecting a style, and so on is also represented by the different parts of this window. The font, the style, the size, and so on. 
So in this case, we don't have different tasks that can, we can you know, execute in sequence. We have different uh, faces of one com composite information. This information about typeface is very complex. It's, bro it's broken down into different categories. And these categories are presented to the user in a, say, uh, in a set of sub-concepts uh, that the user is familiar with. If you dig into the real representation of fonts, uh, uh, you can see that the style is actually a combination of two different attributes. Because a font comes in different uh, styles. So you, if, you, if you look at the list of fonts that are installed into your system, you may have you know, Arial, Arial Narrow, Arial Condensed, Arial Bold, and so on. They are different fonts. And each of them may have variants. Okay? So this is a complex stuff. And the user interface hides this complexity. Let's you choose a font and a set of styles. And this style is a combination of the different fonts of the same family plus the different effects that you can apply on them. This is some simplification that the user interface chooses to do to keep the complexity of the action under the, the knowledge of the user. If you had a, a program for designing fonts, or if you have a graphical designer where you need all the control of the fonts, uh, because, for example, uh, an, uh, the italic version of a font is not the same as applying uh, italics effect slanting uh, to, the, to the Roman version of the font. The, the, the design of the letters is different if you choose the real italic font. Okay? So a graphical designer will know that and will have a more, much more complex interface uh, than this. Okay? At least one more level. So again, it's with, with some information that we have, but we are trying to map it to the information the users have in the, organ in the mental organizations that is familiar to the users. And this makes the difference between this is just a dialogue, but you know where to look for the information you, are, you need. Hmm? Instead of having something which is maybe complex and five pages long and you don't know where to find, the, uh, find, where to find stuff. Uh, it comes to mind as an example, some programs like, you know, for example, Visual Studio Code or ma many other recently, they have uh, extremely long sets of options. Okay, if you go to the settings or to the options, uh, you have you know, pages and pages of options. And they, they, all, they are usually organized uh, by plugins. So this, in this plugin has these options and so on. So, so this is an internal organization of the, of the functionality. So if you want to find where, where to change some option, where to customize, usually you have a search engine. So just imagine that having a search engine into the setting window of a problem, of a program, <laughs> means that uh, they, they didn't find any easy and clear organization for the content themselves. But even the control panel of uh, Windows, you have the search. Uh, box right now because there are so many options that it was not easy to give just one taxonomy that was clear for everybody and so they added a second access method by taxonomy or so by selecting category or by searching a term that the user may be familiar with and so we are planning different access routes to the same information because maybe we discover with the card sorting exercise or with some other technique that users don't agree. So what is familiar to some group of users may not be so familiar to others. And so we need to provide, as we said before, flexible ways of getting to the same information. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, if you want to read some few more, there are a couple of links here. And uh, tomorrow, Sorry, no. And Thursday, sorry, I will make this mistake until the end of the course. We are starting uh, the other big topic, which is prototyping. Mm -hmm. So starting actually to design the look and face of our website. So thank you, and see you in a couple of days.